Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about lions, and it really brings up this issue of animal welfare and wildlife conservation that's been a theme of the China-Africa relationship since at least you and I have been doing this podcast now for the past four years. But I have to say this is the first time that lions have come into the conversation, and that's probably due in part to Cecil the lion. Cecil, if you recall, was a lion who was poached by an American trophy game hunter, Dr. Walter Palmer, back on July 1st. And his death really captured global media attention in very different ways, actually, in both Africa and the rest of the world. But nonetheless, it brought it to the fore. And then from that discussion about La- about Cecil... Uh, it started migrating the conversation to South Africa, where there is a large and growing, um, I don't even know how to kind of characterize it, kind of a domesticating lion business, where they're herding lions for both uh, poaching and hunting, but as well as for the lion bone trade. And simultaneous, in the same month, within weeks of Cecil's passing, uh, a a, a very interesting report was published uh, done by Three interesting groups here. So first, let me read the groups. The nonprofit wildlife conservation group Traffic, in conjunction with Oxford University's Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, which also incidentally was the same group that was monitoring Cecil, and also Witts University, your colleagues there uh, in Johannesburg, Cobus. So we are thrilled today to have two of the participants in this study to join us. Dr. Vivian Wilson, uh, Vivian Williams is a researcher in the School of Animal, Plant, and Environmental Sciences at Witts University, and David Newton, who is the director for Traffic for East Southern Africa, based in Pretoria. A very good afternoon to both of you. Welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you. Let me, I'm just going to start with a slightly skeptical and cynical question here. Um, <laughs> you, and we'll just, and then we'll get into the report. But so yeah. the concern about lions and harvesting them for bones and, and I, you know, sitting here in Vietnam, Southeast Asia, where they're, they're a pretty big consumer of these bones, people will tell you that animals are raised for all sorts of purposes, for fur, for food, for medicine, for lots of things. What is wrong with raising lions to be killed for their bones if it's done in a humane way, just as we raise cows and pigs to be raised for food? Vivian, why don't you take a stab at that? Well, I'd say we'd have, we'd have to clarify that they aren't specifically being raised uh, for their bones. So what happens in South Africa is that we have a very large uh, captive um, population of, of lions, which probably about 60 to 68% of the total lion population in South Africa are, are captive bred animals. Uh, and it would appear that a lot of many of these lions then feed, so to speak, into the trophy hunting uh, business. So, what our research indicates is that um, hunters from all over the world come to South Africa to hunt lions. Um, they very rarely hunt wild lions in South Africa, and so the lions that they would be hunting were probably of captive origin. What would happen in the past, say before 2008, would be that the hunter would shoot the lion and they would then take the trophy, which would be the sometimes the skin or it might be the skull um, and sometimes the floating bones which are the small clavicle uh, bones and after that the skeletons would be discarded. What has happened since 2008 however is that the market or the trade in lion bones started and what seems to be happening is that the bones or the skeletons that are normally discarded following a trophy hunt there's been this sort of opportunistic I suppose um, trade that's developed from um, by exporting these bones that would normally be discarded and and then you know exporting them to eastern and southeast Asia so I, I would be hesitant to say that they are specifically breeding them for the bones because there's a level at which it doesn't make financial sense. If um, and this is what we, you know we were told by people we interviewed is that a hunter pays a lot of money to you know hunt a trophy hunt a, a lion and so the main income is derived from the trophy hunt. Um, 
they're only getting probably, I'd say, um, I don't know, I can't remember the, the, the value of them now. There's only a very small value derived from, from the bones. So what we were told was that it makes no sense for a farmer uh, to breed a lion specifically, a male lion in particular, so for, you know, for the bones. So they would get the main value out of the trophy and, and the, the hunter paying for that trophy. And then um, if they want to, they would then sell, sell those bones. There is a concern about lionesses because they don't perhaps have the same value to a, to a hunter. So I'm very hesitant to, to, to label, you know, this captive industry as, um, saying that they specifically um, supply bones for for that market. Um, that would um, be my if, one. If I can Sorry to, to jump in there. Um, to both of you, um, I wonder if you can clarify the the role of China in in all of this. Um, you know, kind of, it, it was very interesting for me when you know the the report originally. You know, kind of, I found the report because I was I'm always looking for China Africa related issues, and the headlines were line burns exported to China, and then within the within the the, the body of, of some of the articles, it was exported to China and Southeast Asia. And then when I actually got closer and actually looked at your actual report, the report said that that by far the most of the lion bones actually go to Southeast Asia and particularly to Laos. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what you make of the prominence of China in all of this, considering that China apparently seems to be making up a relatively small part of this trade. And to which extent, you know, kind of is... You know, kind of is when when you take into account both the tiger tiger bone and lion bone trade, like how big a consumer of these bones is China actually? Certainly, you're correct in that Laos is the biggest um, importer, and about eighty five percent of the exports have gone to Laos, whereas only about um, less than 0.5 percent have been exported directly to China. But what we um, the suspicion is, of course, is that then from from Southeast Asia, then. Um, it gets exported um, into to China, but perhaps David could um, comment further. Yes, I, I think we, we have a very interesting dynamic with China. Um, as you know, uh, Chinese has, China has a very rich heritage of traditional Chinese medicine, and uh, the, this is a, a traditional use that goes back millennia. So... In China, I think it's been primarily tiger bone that's been used in, in those traditional medicines. And um, I think it's only relatively recently that we've started hearing these reports about uh, tiger bones going to uh, to China. But it's, it, it's extremely difficult to know. Yeah, that's um, lion bones going to China, correct? Lion. If, it's lion, yes. if, if it's lion bone that's actually been included in these medicines. You see, we haven't spent a lot of time researching this in, in China it, itself. Um, we hear that lion bone goes into these, these things and sometimes pictures appear on the medicines. But that's not always to say that it actually contains lion bones. Um, sometimes it may not even contain tiger bone. But, but there, 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 there is no doubt that uh, I, I think the, the traditional use of tiger is probably, uh, and, and the need to, as tigers become uh, scarcer, it is, uh, that decline is probably pushing uh, suppliers to start trying to find alternatives and lion bones are one of those alternatives some of the smaller cats as well are, are attracted into that industry so it, it seems that there's a shift going on but exactly what the volumes are and the trade routes of how those bones would move from laos uh, into china I, I think that's something that still has to be clarified from our perspective yeah, Kobus, uh, that, that part of the market isn't clear. Yeah, Kobus, I think also that there's a conflation in, in the minds of many Western journalists between China and Chinese medicine. And I think some yeah. people may use that interchangeably, assuming that Chinese medicine is practiced in China, when in fact uh, Chinese medicine is practiced all throughout Southeast Asia, uh, and even in the United States and other countries Correct. as well. So uh, that may also be why there's so, so much confusion. David, uh, you know, I think that you have a, you know, you're obviously in the business of trying to persuade people to to not traffic in, 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 in wildlife illegally and also in animal preservation and conservation. And, and from my point of view here, both in Vietnam and my, all the years I've spent in China, it seems like you're, you're going to face a very difficult task to persuade people 
that the mm-hmm. consumption of these products, you know, whether it's pangolin, uh, you know, rhino horn, ivory, or now lion bone, uh, which is the next, but the list of, you know, African wildlife that is consumed as part of traditional mm-hmm. Chinese medicine is long and growing. And what I find here in Vietnam is that when I talk to people about, say, rhino horn, they have no regard whatsoever for the fate of the animal. It, they just, it does, and it's not because people are cynical or they don't care. It's just it's too far of a mental jump for them to go to understand what's, you know, what goes on in Africa, much the same way that the average American consumer has no concern whatsoever for the sweatshop conditions that their underwear was made in. You know, it's just it, there's just too far of a gap there. Oh. And so I guess you know, now that the conversation is moving to lions and lion bones, which, f- as far as I know, are not endangered at this point. They're they're on the red list, but they are close to being endangered. But they're not endangered. But you guys are sounding the alarm in some sense that we have to watch out for this. What do you do to challenge those perceptions here in Southeast Asia and in China for them and for people to actually care? Well, yes, that, that, that's part of the uh, complexity that we face. And uh, just at the outset, I'd like to say that traffic, traffic's position on this is, is that we're neither pro-trade nor anti-trade. Uh, I think our, our position is very much to assess levels of trade, whether it's legal or illegal, and to assess that impact on wild populations of the species being traded. Um, so I, I think that wherever we come across a situation where a species is under pressure, and uh, perhaps we can say that lions are that, so we could say pangolins, we could say uh, many fish stocks around the world are under pressure. And uh, we need to very quickly identify the, the usage that places the most pressure on that species, and we need to very proactively engage with that consumer group, whether it's a traditional medicine group or whether it's uh, some other commercial group, uh, that is trying to push a new use of uh, for this species. Um, we need to engage with them and, and we have to try and uh, persuade them to change that consumption behavior in a way that reduces the demand so that uh, the wild species are, are not uh, threatened. Um, now obviously, in, in South Africa's case, we, we've not found any evidence that uh, wild populations of South African lions are, are under threat are facing a a threat uh, because most are coming out of captive populations. But I I think our our concern would be further to the north of the border, north of South Africa's border in in neighboring countries and further afield, where there is evidence that that wild lines are being sourced to supply a bone market and other markets. Um, And other markets. So we need to quantify that as quickly as possible. uh, And... uh, urgently identify the consumer group so that we can start that uh, uh, the consumer behavior change work that uh, we find so important in other work that we do in Southeast Asia. And uh, just to say that uh, we, we've worked for a number of years with Chinese authorities and other Asian authorities, and we've we found them in most respects to be very responsive to to the type of information we provide where we can justify our position saying that, well, unless you change this behavior, the species is going to face a problem. So we do get a lot of collaboration, and uh, we find that very encouraging. That's not to say that there aren't uh, incredibly big problems facing us at this stage. Uh, There are. Uh, But we really just have to continue the work that that we're doing. And uh, research like we've done on lions now, uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, We're really trying to get to the bottom of this issue at at a continental level. I was I was going to say as well though is that um, you know I think when when the use and I suppose we could say that um, instead of just calling it um, you know Chinese traditional medicine one could call it you know traditional Asian med- medicine which would then incorporate uh, usage within you know Southeast Asia but I think you know it's just like the usage of traditional medicine um, in Africa if it's part of your worldview that these products are effective then to implement demand reduction measures to try and uh, uh, to, to try and change that, that a um, att- attempt to change that view is actually, you know, quite uh, quite difficult. I think the other point of clarification is is that um, in South Africa, uh, our wild populations are 
um, are not threatened, but uh, in the, on the, across the rest of Africa, they are threatened and they're vulnerable because there's been about a 42% decline in the African population of lions over the last 21 years. And some of that has to do with mm. a human, uh, con- uh, human b- uh, behavior and consumptive use of, of lions, whether it be for domestic purposes um, or um, and so you would find, you know, poaching of lions and harvesting um, or whatever. I mean, there's a whole range of categories of, of products that, that are utilized and accordingly, you know, reasons and uh, methods and by which these animals are harvested. And there's certainly rumors coming out of southern Africa that there are other countries who, uh, where uh, the bones, as I said, are, are, might be exported to, to Asia. But those would probably be poached animals. Uh, and so South Africa is unique in that the bones almost certainly come from the captive population. I suppose one one of the the complicating issues is that this situation can change so quickly. Um, yes. You know, the the both the rhino poaching and elephant poaching took off so quickly that I think yes. frequently Afri- African wildlife, um, you know, kind of conservation authorities were kind of taken were slightly taken unawares. Yes. Um, one another issue, of course, you know, in, especially in the case of ivory, is the the confusion between between the the so called legitimate or legal trade in ivory. That that the Chinese government recently announced that they're going to ban, um, and you know illegal ivory and, the, and distinguishing between the two. Um, if you, if the two of you could could give um, governments advice on what kind of po- um, policy environment to create in order to avoid the that avoid the, a similar problem as you see with elephants and rhinos um, developing with lions. What kind of policy would you suggest that they they follow in terms of the issue of, of regulating trade? I, I think it's um, <clears throat> it's not just a policy suggestion for the consumer countries, but for the producer countries too. And uh, of course, transparency is always something that we strive for when we're trying to uh, bring trades into a on, well to put it onto a sustainable footing. Um, and uh, I, I think that. Um, well, I, I think that we, we found that the permitting system is to some extent a, a problem in, in South Africa, and uh, that's one of the issues that needs to be resolved. Um, I, there are a number of uh, suggestions in the report that, that, that we're putting forward. I, I, I think to encourage the, the law enforcement authorities in the consumer countries to, to do things in a way that they know who is bringing what wildlife product into the country, and they and they can track it from start, from where it's imported all the way through to the final product. I think that is ideally what we are striving for, and that would be a big policy change. Uh, I think that's going to take a lot of work because I think we're nowhere near achieving that level of transparency. And uh, of course, you've mentioned the ivory trade, and I think that that is um, that is a, a trade where. Where at one level uh, there is great transparency in the legal trade, but the illegal trade is completely non-transparent, and that often arises from ports in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and also in the past from South Africa, where you have uh, organised criminals involved in moving commercial scale volumes of ivory. Uh, the same applies to rhino horn. A lot of this is is like having an earthquake in one part of the world. There's a lot of pressure built up over a certain issue when the earth shakes and it breaks open this this whole issue. And then you don't expect the tsunami to happen on the other side of the world that's equally uh, destructive. Um, And, you know, when the tsunami hits, um, you know, I was it ten years ago. Nobody, you know, expected that. So I tend to think of it as that. And so, if you want looking at at measures, you've got to look very broadly, rather than being very species specific or too focused on one particular aspect of trade. Because trade in lions involves many different things. It involves, as I said, the trade in bones. It's the trophy hunting. It's consumptive use. There's all these sort of products, and both in a domestic trade and international trade. And I suppose you have to look at it holistically and say, right, if I do that, then what might the impact be? And if I do that, what might the impact be? And then try and come up with something that uh, is a so maybe, maybe sometimes a compromise, but has an, uh, the effect of lessening the overall impact rather than creating, you know, you solve one problem and then you create another. I think it's terribly complex because it involves 
um, culture, different cultures and different role players, and it's an international trade, and it's fascinating, ter- terribly fascinating in, in a way. <laughs> no, it is absolutely fascinating, and the report is called Bones of Contention, an assessment of the South African trade in African lion, uh, lion, panthera, leo bones, and other body parts, uh, produced by three organizations, the nonprofit Wildlife Conservation Group, uh, Traffic, Oxford University's Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, and Witt University in Johannesburg. Dr. Vivian Wilson, thank you so much for joining Joining us today. It was really wonderful to hear your perspectives on this. Thank you. And David, uh, thank you as well. And David, if people want to follow the, the work that Traffic is doing, uh, not only in lions, but in, in other animals and uh, in, in, the, in the work that you're doing in the wildlife trade, what's the best way for them to stay in touch and to follow your activities? Uh, well, probably the best uh, way is to uh, simply go to our website. All our contact details are there. Um, but, uh, and so that is www.traffic.org. And uh, also you can find the paper there, correct? The report's also available on your website, right? Yes. Yes, that's e- correct. Excellent. Uh, so press releases and the report is there. Fantastic. And Kobus, if people want to follow what you're doing, uh, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? So you can follow me on our Facebook page. Uh, we aggregate a 24-hour stream of China-Africa news items um, uh, across a whole range of different topics. Um, and I'll, I'm also on Twitter at Stadenesque. That's S-T-A-D-N-E-S-Q-U-E. And you can find me on Twitter as well at E-O-Lander, E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. And of course, if you want to follow this podcast, best way to do it, head over to iTunes, just type in the words China and Africa, and we'll come right on up there. So we'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening.